In February 2021, the Apex Bank, that is the central bank of Nigeria, CBN, directed banks to close accounts of persons or entities involved in cryptocurrency transactions within their systems. In a circular release to deposit money, banks, non-bank financial institutions and other financial institutions, the Apex Bank noted that disobedience to the directive would attract severe penalties. So far, six banks have been fined 1.31 billion naira. Also on the show today, the United Nations Food Agency says world food prices jumped nearly 13% in March to a new record high as the war in Ukraine caused turmoil in markets for staple grains and edible oils. Now, what's the implication of all of this? Welcome to Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin. Akadone. Uh, before we get into the discussion proper here, a highlight of what went down in Business Nigeria this week. Take a look. The federal government borrowed 2.2 trillion naira from local investors in the first quarter of the year through federal government bonds, treasury bills, and the federal government savings bonds. This is part of effort to fund the 6.4 trillion naira deficit spending in 2022 budget. And this represents an 8.6% decline when compared to 2.4 trillion naira representing 8.6% year-on-year decline from 2.43 trillion sold in quarter 1, 2021. But the federal government also paid local investors 827 billion naira for loans through mature treasury bills, resulting in net borrowings of 1.93 trillion naira from local investors in quarter 1, 2022. Two million people will start receiving about 20 billion naira from June this year as basic cash transfers and conditional cash transfers under the National Cash Transfer Program. The federal government would pay the 2 million people 5,000 Naira each. Over time, the number of people receiving cash transfers from the federal government has been increasing. In 2018, a total of 19 states were covered under the National Cash Transfer Program. This increased to 24 states in 2019 and moved up to 36 states and the FCT in 2022, covering 1.6 million people under the cash transfer scheme, the federal government supports poor and vulnerable households with cash on a monthly basis. Nigerians have been reminded by the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, to avoid engaging with illegal and unregistered financial operators with who entice and scam members of the public with large profits. This was contained in a circular released on the CBN website. The Apex Bank told the public to check the website of the CBN, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and other relevant member agencies of the FSRCC before investing in such companies and schemes. Some telecommunication subscribers were left stranded on Tuesday after telecom companies barred their lines from making calls following a directive from the federal government. On Monday, the federal government had directed telecom companies to enforce compliance with its National Identification Number Subscriber Identity Model Policy by blocking outgoing calls on all unlinked lines after the deadline for the SIM NRN verification expired on March the 31st. A former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, says Nigerians now spend 100% of their salary to feed themselves. He said that Nigeria is in a crisis situation and that the federal government needs to focus on creating wealth. He also revealed his displeasure with the rising rate of insecurity and poverty in Nigeria, citing that the Buhari administration has been too focused on wealth sharing through its various welfare schemes. And those were the stories that made headlines uh, this week.
Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has penalized six banks for 1.314 billion naira over alleged non-compliance with a regulation on cryptocurrency accounts. The banks include Stambik IBTC, First City Monument Bank, FCNB, Access Bank, Wema Bank, United Bank for Africa, and Fidelity Bank. Now, Stambik IBTC Bank, the domestic unit of Standard Bank Group Limited, was fined 200 million naira for failing to comply with the APES Bank's directive. According to the lender's 2021 consolidated and separate financial statement, now CEO of Streetnomics uh, economist uh, Gospel Obele joins us in this conversation. Good evening to you, Gospel. Thanks for joining us on Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Yes, it is indeed a pleasure. Gospel, we're talking about 1.3 uh, billion naira. That's a whole lot of money. But the main question right now would be, what could be responsible for these infractions? Is it that um, it, it is very difficult for the banks uh, to uh, pin down the transactions or the account transacting in cryptocurrency? Yeah, so um, we, we, a lot of times we get to underestimate the demand side pressure on um, on um, the financial system, you know, in terms of um, inflows, moving cash around, transfers, you know, how money moves around a lot of times. Um, two things I see here is number one, in my own opinion, it will be from the demand side, you know, people making transfers and the description is not quite correct or the process of wiring is um, done in a very in a way that it looks like a very legitimate transaction in court. You know, um, transactions that are out of the core of the CBN direct uh, operatives or directives in a sense. In many other cases as well, there's a lack of proper control mechanisms such that you can actually track which transaction is coming from where. Still a business inside on Plus TV Africa. We'll take a very quick break and come and talk more with Gospel in a moment. Welcome back. It's still Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. We have Gospel Obele, an economist, and we are talking about the crackdown on uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, Gospel, just before the break, you were telling us about um, internal mechanisms of banks. All right, great. So I'm saying that um, top down from the central bank flowing down to the commercial banks, there are conversations on how you regulate and how you internally control you know, policies that have probably been held back or, you know, you know, policies that the central bank has rolled out in time past. How do you ensure that there's a level of compliance from the angle of commercial banks? That's one. Um, secondly, in, within the context of commercial banks now, there are further down internal control gaps because a lot of commercial banks don't even have data or don't, don't know how to use the data they have to track correctly where transactions are coming from. Plus, with the fact that um, demand-side crypto markets have intelligently moved ahead, all right, in you know leaving descriptions or reworking descriptions around transactions so a transaction may come in and doesn't look like a crypto transaction all right so a lot of times these so-called faults or errors or seemingly going part of um, the track of um, directives given by the central bank by commercial banks is a function of internal controls and poor internal tracking system um in, in, to a very large extent but however we can also not, not also leave out the fact that commercial banks can be very very naive in the context or probably seeking to also gain the system in themselves um that's my thoughts that's my initial thought all right uh, with all of this happening uh, six banks have been fined at 1.3 billion now it goes to tell that the cbn is actually very serious about uh, this issue of uh, cryptocurrency, you know, actually dashing the hopes of our future uh, integration, you know, because it's, I need a bit of clarity right now, uh, Gospel, because from what we understand, again, a few months ago, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, uh, opened some sort of um, a crypto the department, you know, giving uh, Nigerians some sort of hope that over time there'll be some sort of inclusion and the integration of, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, the blockchain into our financial services. So what does this really tell? 
Yes, so one fundamental thing and body language is, we've um, uh, seen from the central bank is a lack of a collaborative strategy slash willingness to, uh, to adopt um, the global um, blockchain um, disruption and how that's going to impact on financial institutions and monetary systems development to a large extent. Um, in turn, more intentional nations are seeking to um, find more intelligent ways to collaborate as well as protect the integrity of the traditional systems whilst welcoming new innovation. We've not been able to see that clearly from the central bank, and um, it also tilts further to some sort of misalignment in communication, in will, and in um, efforts by the central bank and the Security Exchange Commission. So that's to tell you that regulatory-wise, we have a very long journey ahead of us in terms of integration and leading in blockchain technology globally, as well as um, financial systems integration as well. So it speaks heavily around the misalignment in the system and the lack of willingness to embrace change. Um, and that, that's the cause for worry going forward into the future. But Gospel, one would wonder if uh, we are actually uh maybe walking in circles or just uh, trying to be a bit stagnated because the entire world, as it were, you know, are embracing, you know, or is embracing rather this uh, blockchain technology and it's actually doing most banks globally, doing them very well in terms of, uh, you know, returns and all of that. Uh, why are we not really looking in that direction? Yes, number one, um, first off, it's important for us to note that um, the world is moving in that order, but clearly, almost 85% of countries right now are seeking to understand better, all right, how to deploy cryptocurrencies. You know, and in some contexts, you're thinking of them as assets. In some contexts, you're thinking of them as commodities. In some other contexts, um, there's a perceived uh, medium of exchange. You know, crypto is already seen as a, as a medium of exchange, but it hasn't been made legal as a medium of exchange. So, um, yes, the, the acceptance you see globally has been, you know, efforts towards um, um, accepting the disruption, but we have, but yet define what that disruption is within their context. However, in the Nigerian context, we've seen an outright trying to kick against crypto by number one, policy ban, and number two, an immature early um, 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 rollout of e-currency or G2 currency or e-Naira. All right, so we have not just um, shown a body language or a disinterest to accept crypto, but we've also sought to counter crypto and even further punish or penalize institutions that are seeking to manage the excessiveness of this disruption in the time. So I think Nigeria has a very long way to go. And even the way we've been handling the crypto drive and the crypto disruption has largely been unintelligent and, 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 and showed that we've lacked um, it, 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 we, we, we lack to show of understanding or proof of concept of what cryptocurrencies or the blockchain technology as a whole can offer in terms of enabling financial institution development. And that's going to, in the long term, all right, bring about the level of um, um, uh, perceived lack of financial readiness to embrace innovation. I don't think it's a very good position for the Nigerian economy in the long term. And uh, we are also proving to be very, very... Um, unintelligent, you know, around um, uh, leading technologies in the frontier of development uh, in the 21st century. All right, uh, Gospel, just before we move to world food prices, now, just uh, on, a, um, on a bit of an advisory note, uh, what would you advise uh, the these banks uh, so they can forestall these uh, infractions, uh, you know, happening again uh, in future? Well, in my own opinion, to be very honest, I think, in my own opinion, I think that the, cent the, the both the central and commercial bank can only try hard to manage the situation, but they cannot contain the situation. The reason why you cannot contain the situation is because you don't understand it in the first place. You can only correctly regulate what you understand, or you can only correctly regulate what you've been a part of. All right, so the, the body language from the, from the central bank leading down to the commercial bank has been a rejection, a rejection and a gross disinterest in seeking to understand. Now, because you've done that, when, uh, because you've done that and you cannot also contain the demand drive for crypto transactions, all right, it means technically 
you cannot truly, in the real sense of things, regulate it to a full extent. What you can only do is to probably manage and probably use some tough sanctions and processes to, you know, right. to, to punish offenders in court. So in my own opinion, I think at best we will only be able to manage. But in the long term, I see this whole conversation spiraling out of control because you cannot contain the global um, blockchain drive. Whether you're ready or not, it would definitely hamper heavily on your monetary systems. And um, taking the counter approach is not intelligent in my opinion in this All case. Right. All right, uh, before we go, uh, Gospel, let's talk about the world food prices. Uh, it has jumped nearly 13% in March to a new record high. You know, it's all in the wake of um, the you know, Russian invasion on Ukraine. What do we have in our hands? Let's bring it closer home here to Nigeria. Um, the, the Nigerian context is quite a very hurting situation. It's painful, it's hurting, and it, it, um, it could have been avoided. The conversation of rising food prices is no longer a conversation of uh, just, um, it, it has now grown to become not just demand pull, but a largely cost push. Cost push because the critical structural dynamics, all right, that impact on the cost centers of the Nigerian economy are seriously crippled, all right? And they are further crippling um, due to the actions and inactions of critical stakeholders on that value chain. All right, how can you, in one month, have um, full scarcity as a result of dirty fuel or polluted fuel, and you also have the national grid failure? All right, that is, that is a complete recipe for disaster. That's a complete recipe for hike in, 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 in food prices. And let's not get it twisted, because, I mean, the, the MBS can come and say inflation has dropped by 1%. No, inflation hasn't dropped. Inflation talks about the rise in food prices. Inflation rate talks about the, the pace at which all right, that price, those prices increase. So even if inflation drops from 13% to 12% or from 15 to 14, it simply tells us that the rate of increase in food prices has slowed down. It doesn't tell you that the price of tomatoes has dropped. No, it means that the rate at which the price of tomato is going up has reduced. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the English here that a lot of Nigerians don't grasp. And it comes up as a political correctness to, you know, from the central bank and the NBS and the fiscal policy guys. All right. The conversation here is that structural issues must be dealt with so that cost pressure centers are relaxed and that way food, um, impact on food prices can be contained and slowed down, despite the fact that we cannot even feed our population, in a sense. All right, uh, Gospel, on a final note, now, I want us to talk specifically about um, the global price of um, wheat. Uh, it seems as though the issues uh, in um, Ukraine you know, is actually doing the world uh, a whole lot of bad. But specifically right now, you know, wheat now in Nigeria, the, 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 uh, the cost of um, bread and other you know, confectioners have actually gone up in Nigeria. How can we avert this? What do we begin to do locally? All right. Um, I mean, first off, it, it's very important to note that um, global the, the, the level at which global shocks will hit your economy, the effect of global shocks on your economy, is a function of where you are on the on the on the developmental ladder. The lower you are on that ladder, meaning that you don't have a lot of structural buffers or strength internally as an economy to take in shock, the more the effect on your economy. So for Nigeria, we expect more. You right? All right, uh, because. The Russia-Ukraine conversation is out of control. And when you're looking at leadership and trying to make decisions to protect your own, you need to be able to identify what is within your circle of influence and what is within your circle of control. In this context, all right, both the Russian and Ukraine story is within, is out of our circle of influence and out of our circle of control. At best, Nigeria will only begin to receive the repercussions of this changing narrative. So it means that what we need, we need to begin to do some certain things differently because this is not the first time. It happened during the Gulf War, all right? It means that we didn't simply learn from the past. So we need to do more around fixing our structures, all right? Mm -hmm. And ensuring that we are a strongly self-dependent nation that with or without geopolitics or globalization, we can do more for ourselves as a people, as a nation. Other than that, we'll keep being at the mercy of any change or structural issue that happens globally, be it right. a pandemic or be it geopolitics. All right, thank you so much, uh, the Gospel Obeli, for your time. Uh, we are completely out thank of you, time. Jay, for we do appreciate um, 
all of your inputs that you have shared with us today. Thank you for having me. It is indeed a pleasure. And that's the size of the show for today. My name is Justin Akadone. Uh, Business Insights returns again next time. Bye for now.